Hi, everybody. Thank you and welcome. Um, my name is Zach Wurzel. Um, I am the manager of experiential learning for the Bauer College of Business. Uh, and I also serve as career development specialist for undergraduate marketing and entrepreneurship students. Uh, thank you for coming to today's webinar for the Recruiters Get Real Serious. Um, we have a great guest today with us, um, Mariah Wills from Protivity. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Mariah to introduce herself, um, and then we will get into questions. So I'll let Mariah introduce herself. Thanks, Zach. So glad to be here today and glad to connect with students and answer any questions that you have. My name is Mariah Wills. I um, am a campus recruiter at Productivity, and I sit in our Houston office. I am native to Houston, born and raised here, and I actually graduated from the University of Houston, um, class of 2016, go Cougs. I'm so proud to be back and connecting with Bauer students. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. Um, we uh, are always love to have alums with us. Um, so first question, um, can you talk a little bit about as a recruiter, what do you look for in a candidate? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, what I look for in a candidate is pretty much the same, no matter what role I'm recruiting for or um, what company I'm recruiting at. There are probably five really key characteristics that I look for in a candidate. And I would say one of those first things is passion. Um, so I'm looking for candidates who are passionate, passionate about what they do or passionate about what they're going to get to do um, in the role that they're applying for with the company. And I think this really translates to the day-to-day -day of your role as well. Um, I'm looking for candidates who are going to be passionate about being able to get up every day and be successful in that role, even when it's the day-to-day -day grind. Um, so some of the things that help me gauge that are things like candidates sharing examples of times when they um, showed up for a project or for a role early instead of just on time. They were really engaged. They were excited to get started. Um, I look for candidates who have um, a history of asking for more work. Um, so not just waiting for someone to come to them with work, but really wondering what, what is it that I can do to get my hands dirty and get involved right now. Um, candidates that are interested in volunteering or gaining any type of additional experience. And then I look for candidates who are curious and all of those things kind of relate back to me, um, that level of passion for a candidate. I also look for um, candidates who have a desire to grow and to continue to learn. That hunger um, for always gaining more knowledge um, is something that's really key. I think it also helps to show whether or not a candidate is coachable. Um, are they able to receive feedback and take initiative to action on that feedback? Um, I look for candidates who do their homework. Um, so these are the candidates that didn't just Google the company. Um, maybe they, they sought out to speak with a past intern to learn more about the internship program, what that intern really enjoyed, what they felt they didn't enjoy as much, and um, maybe what are those things that they did during the internship to help make them successful. Um, Maybe they sought to speak with a, a current employee. So they set up an informational interview and that was one of the ways they, they got to know more about the company or the role that they're interested in. Um, I look for candidates who research the industry. So not just the company that they're interested in, but what are those overarching themes or current events going on across the industry? And then candidates who did some additional research on the role. So maybe what does this role look like at other organizations? What are things that I could bring to the role to help improve? Um, I also look for candidates who are team players. I think regardless of what type of role you're going into, whether or not um, you'll be the person that has a lot of time where your head's down and you're working independently, or you'll be working more collaboratively most of the time, um, at some point you're going to work on a team. Um, so it's really important to me to find those candidates that are team players. And then the last attribute that I look for is candidates who are critical thinkers, who are creative and who can think outside of the box. So are you able to be innovative? Are you going to bring new ideas? And if so, how do you bring those new ideas to the table? What are the ways that you seek to present that new information? And then how do you explore points of improvement and um, both, both in the past and what do you think those points of improvement could be going into this new role? 
Um, so those are really all the things that I look for in a candidate um, when I'm having some of those initial conversations. Well, thank you. I think that's all um, great stuff for uh, students to hear. Um, I wanted to follow up on one of those pieces because I think it's important and something that I get asked a lot is um, you talked about research um, and the type of research mm -hmm. you'd want a candidate to do. Um, how would you, uh, as a candidate or as a recruiter, how would you want the candidate to talk to you about that? So whether that be in a career fair setting or an interview, what's the, like, uh, what, what do you think is like the least awkward way for, for them to bring up the research that they've done? Yeah, so I would say all of the above. Um, it could be in a career fair setting as you're approaching a recruiter. Maybe you've done some homework and you um, have done just some initial research on what type of opportunities are provided at that company. So if you're looking for an internship, maybe you've dug in and really tried to understand what the past internships have looked like. That could be a cool way to bring up um, some research that you've done for a company. Or um, maybe you're looking for entry-level roles. So um, you're looking at whether or not a company has rotational programs or specific entry-level roles that you've seen online. Um, basically, you know, letting the recruiter know that, hey, I, I did go out to your company website and I saw this, um, or I was interested in this role that's posted. And so that kind of triggers for me as a recruiter, hey, this person did their homework. Or um, I think back to that piece that I was talking about, about industry knowledge. Um, maybe you're tying in some sort of current event that you saw um, going on in the industry that you were interested in. For example, maybe you noticed that there is a specific, um, you know, overarching theme in HR that, um, you know, people who are working in the HR um, field are trying to solve as it relates to the oil and gas industry, for example. So maybe bringing up an article that you saw, or you read when you were doing um, company research, that could be a good way to get the conversation started with the recruiter or in an interview setting. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, I think that's, that, that's really helpful. Um, it, it sometimes is difficult to figure out like, what are the places you can get that information into those conversations. So I think that's really helpful. Um, a, a second piece you mentioned was uh, people volunteering are, um, are uh, and, and I think uh, whether that's volunteering kind of in a company being a team player like you talked about um, or volunteering in the community. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, volunteering in the community or doing volunteer work and how you see that as equal to experience? So maybe a student that doesn't have uh, as much work experience, what they could do volunteer-wise to make a good impression. Absolutely. I, I think volunteering is um, just as relevant as work experience, um, especially when you can tie in that volunteer opportunity to something that you're passionate or interested in um, in your professional career. So one of the things that I think about um, as an example, as it relates to maybe accounting majors is being able to volunteer through the VITA program. Um, so going out and being able to help individuals within the community as they're looking to file their taxes. That's directly related uh, potentially to something that you might do along the lines um, in your career, um, but it's also a volunteer activity. And while it's not work experience, it's experience that's getting you some of those more meaty, tangible ways to um, be able to say, hey, I've done this before. And I think being able to speak to that volunteer experience in an interview setting is just as relevant as any work experience that you may have had um, through an internship or a short-term role. Um, the other thing that comes to mind when I think about volunteering as well, and maybe it's a different way to think about volunteering, is job shadowing. Um, so maybe if you've got an opportunity to set up time, it doesn't have to be long term, but it could be maybe just a couple of afternoons over the summer where you're connecting with individuals that are, are in the field that you're interested in. Maybe it goes back to you raising your hand and saying, hey, how can I get an opportunity to help you do something or learn how you do that something? Um, I also think that that could be a really great experience as well, um, even if it's not something that you're directly you know, getting paid for, it's, it's another volunteer opportunity, right? Yeah, I, I think that, that that's great advice. Um, and all of those are great ways for students to get some experiences on their resume to, to, to help that um, they may not have that direct work experience. Um, 
I have had some good questions uh, coming in so far, but if anyone has other questions, please feel free to shoot me questions in chat and I'll make sure that they get asked. Um, one thing that uh, I got come through um, was, can you talk about uh, salary negotiation? Uh, should I try to negotiate an offer? Um, and how do I even start that conversation? Yeah, I, I think this is a question I get often as well. Um, so I would answer that question. Yes, you should try to negotiate an offer and take into consideration the fact that some companies do have pretty defined starting compensation points for entry-level roles. Um, so when I say entry-level roles, I mean internship positions, full-time roles for recent college grads. And just to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit, this is done for several reasons. Sometimes it's to create equity across the organization or to ensure that you have fair um, and competitive salary increases as you progress in your role, even before your next promotion. So think about those merit-based salary increases that sometimes we might forget that we'll, we'll be potentially eligible for. Um, other times companies may be trying to stay within a budget for strategic reasons, um, but it never hurts to ask. Um, so keep in mind, timing is really important here. Um, if you are going to negotiate, it should be a counter offer. Um, so that implies and assumes that you already have an offer in hand. Um, so negotiate once you've got that offer in hand. Um, and before negotiating, make sure that you are doing your research. So there are lots of websites like Payscale um, that you can access through the Rockwell Career Center website, shameless plug, <laughs> that you can help um, use to determine what the average range is for a role at a specific company or in a specific industry. Um, you also want to make sure you're doing that apples to apples comparison, right? Um, so job titles can vary from company to company. Salary ranges can look different in industry versus maybe in a role at a mid-sized firm. And just as important as taking into consideration location. Um, so some companies, and this could be helpful for you to find out what the company that you're interested in um, takes as their strategy. Um, some companies pay by cost of labor, um, which is basically the difference in pay um, based on a labor market for a job in a specific location. Some companies pay by cost of living. Um, so that is where they're going to take into consideration um, things like the price of food, housing, groceries, entertainment, things of that nature. So obviously, if they're paying by cost of living, you can expect that that entry level salary might be a little bit more than if they're paying by cost of labor. So all these things you want to take into consideration as you're doing your research. And then um, once you've done your research, if you do think that the salary that you've been offered is a little low, I would suggest countering with a figure that's maybe no more than five to 10% above the initial offer. You do wanna remember that it's an entry level role. So you shouldn't expect something above the salary range, um, but definitely be confident. You wanna use your skills, your experience, any relevant competing offers to support that conversation that you're having. And I think at the end of the day, you already know that the company is interested in you enough to make an offer. The last thing you want to do is create awkwardness or animosity between your future employer, but you also want to make sure on your end that you feel like you're being treated equitably. So take all of those things in consideration, but I would definitely say it never hurts to ask. Yeah, I, I think that is something that uh, the answer is always no, unless you ask. So, right. um, so I think, I think, I, I think you give a really good breakdown of, Kind of the ways you can go about asking, um, but but the ask is, is definitely important. Um, uh, and I think it was really important that you said kind of what the range is that you can ask for, um, because uh, asking for maybe more than that may create that animosity you're talking about. So um, I, I think something that's uh, we get asked a lot is, as career counselors, um, and it might be another place where you can shed some light on is why sometimes does the hiring process take so long? So I turn in a resume um, and then maybe it takes two weeks or a month to hear back. And then it, it, it could definitely take longer than maybe sometimes students think it's gonna take. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? 
Absolutely. And I, I know that can be a little bit frustrating for a candidate. So happy to help try to share a little bit about what's going on, maybe on the back end. Um, the first thing that I would say to take into consideration is that interview scheduling piece. Um, so as a candidate, imagine what goes on between you and the recruiter or you and the person that's reaching out to you to schedule an interview, whether that's the initial interview or if a, if a company has several rounds of interviews, it's sometimes a little bit of back and forth there, right? And so um, I'll also give a couple of tips. I would say the tip number one is definitely to do your part um, to really help that interview scheduling process go smoothly. Um, so if someone is reaching out and asking for your availability, um, give more availability than less, um, give all the dates that you're available for versus um, maybe just one date um, that week that you may be available for. Definitely make sure you're available, but um, I think giving, giving more dates than less is definitely helpful um, because that interview scheduling piece, it's happening for you, but it's also probably happening multiplied times five or 10 other candidates. Um, so there's a little bit of coordination in the back end. It's kind of a puzzle piece to make sure um, that scheduling lines up across all candidates plus all interviewers. Um, the other thing that you can take into consideration is that um, a lot of times companies are also trying to do some equity across the candidate pool. Um, so you may not be the only candidate and you're likely not the only candidate that's interviewing for that position. Um, and companies do this because they are trying to confirm that they're making the right choice. Um, so take that into consideration as well. There are probably multiple candidates who are involved in the interview process. Um, and then there also may be additional rounds of interviews. Um, so if a company is setting up maybe a second interview to more thoroughly vet one of the candidates, um, that could add some additional time into that process. Um, the other piece is sometimes something may have changed internally. And so the company is trying to make sure that they are providing the most accurate and up-to-date information to the candidates um, who are moving forward in the interview process and trying to make sure that they iron out all of those pieces before moving candidates forward in that process. So a couple of other tips that I would give is definitely level set your expectations early. Um, if you are speaking with a recruiter or someone who's helping to schedule your interview, it is absolutely okay to ask them what that interview timeline looks like. That just helps you get a more realistic preview. Um, it helps you set your expectations. And then it also um, allows you to kind of understand what that estimate might look like. Um, the other thing is don't withhold um, crucial decision-making information. So it's definitely a two-way street, the interview process. If you do have other deadlines to take into consideration or you have other offers on the table, um, it may be a good idea to communicate that with the person that you are going through the interview scheduling process with um, as that will help them with getting all of those pieces together or even trying to push the interviewers a little bit on the back end to speed up that process for you. Um, and the other thing that I would say, and this is me taking off my Mariah, the productivity recruiter hat and speaking to you as candidates um, and giving information that I would have wanted to hear as a student is to assume that you didn't get the job. I know that sounds harsh, but Definitely the reason that I'm saying that is because you don't want to put your job search on pause until you have an offer in hand. Um, and so you can always use another offer in hand to help negotiate with a company that you're going through the interview process with, um, but you don't want to sell yourself short. Um, and on the same end of the token, if you do have an offer that you've signed, definitely don't keep looking for another job. Um, you've made that commitment with a company. Um, and so now you, you wanna really lean in on that commitment that you've made. So hopefully that helps clarify some of the things that are going on on the back end. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think you hit on a couple of points that are very crucial, just professionalism pieces there at the end. Um, that um, if, uh, especially if you have an accepted offer that you've signed, uh, your, your job search is done for that moment. So um, it, it's always good to hear recruiters back up a lot of the things that we share with students as well. 
Um, so a, a little bit of a different topic, um, but I got a question about career fairs. Um, uh, 30 second introductions. Um, do you want one? Uh, do you want students to have a kind of prepared introduction for you? Or what would you say is the best or um, uh, even a, like, do people take creative ways to approach you as a recruiter? What are things that you've seen before and, and what do you what do you think has been the best? Yeah, I I honestly I love the 30 second introduction. I like the elevator piece. I think it helps. Number one, um, if you are just starting that career fair process, um, maybe it's your first time going to a career fair. Sometimes that can be a little bit scary, right? So the 30 second introduction helps you in terms of preparing for what are those really crucial points of information that I want an interviewer to know about me as a person, but also um, what is it that I I want to get from the recruiter um, in terms of questions that I need to ask to understand whether or not this company or this role is going to be the right fit for me. So I think um, the 30 second introduction, it's, it's getting out a couple of things, right? It's that standard background information on yourself who you are, your name, um, what classification you are, which also will help tie in for the recruiter and trigger, you know, what, what type of roles you might be qualified for, um, what your major is, um, what type of positions you're looking for, if you know what that is, and then also um, just sharing maybe what you're hoping to get out of that conversation with the recruiter. So maybe you're ending that 30 second conversation with, you know, it might be a good point to bring up, I did some research on the company and I saw XYZ, can you tell me a little bit more about this? Or um, maybe you're really interested in the internship program, share that. What more can you tell me about the interview process or when is your application opening? So it also helps to just kind of jumpstart that conversation. The only thing that I would add to that is definitely try to make it um, as conversational as possible. Um, so you want to relay that information to the recruiter or to the representative that you're speaking with, um, but you also don't want it to feel rehearsed. Um, so that takes some practice, that takes some time doing it a couple of times, um, but definitely, um, you know, it's okay if, if the other person kind of jumps in and, you know, something about your background really sparks something for them. And that, that in and of itself um, jump starts the conversation for you. Don't feel like you've got to get, you know, that entire 30 seconds out perfectly. It's really just a conversation starter. Cool. Thank you. I think that's, that's a really good way to think about that. Um, I'm going to stay on that same sort of piece with, uh, should we go with, uh, Kind of the tried and true or should we get creative what is your view on unique resumes so resumes that go <laughs> beyond uh say the bower template that we give uh students um resumes with color resumes with pictures stuff like that yeah so um generally speaking i would definitely recommend that you use the bower resume template it's clean it's organized it helps us as recruiters to look for exactly the information that we need to know to make a decision about whether or not you're qualified for an open role at the company however and this is the hr part of my answer i will also say it depends right if you do want to get creative um sometimes creativity could be helpful but I think it really depends on the role that you're applying for. So for example, if you're applying for a role in maybe more of a creative field, um, a graphic designer, a fashion merchandiser, an animator, um, you may get kudos for <laughs> creativity through the resume process. Um, but this really largely depends on the company. And it's a great question to ask a recruiter or company representative at the specific company that you're applying for. Um, I always like to remind students that resumes are a fluid document. You shouldn't just be copy pasting your resume from one job to the other or job application to the other. So it's okay to kind of get that feedback if you have the opportunity to um, from a recruiter about what, what they're hoping to see um, through your resume. And if it is more of a creative role, um, you know, you may get some props for that. I would also just kind of say, be careful, um, because your goal should also be to do everything that you can to not influence any additional bias 
on the recruiter's end, whether it's conscious or subconscious. Um, and sometimes, you know, steering from those more um, templated resumes could potentially um, trigger some of that bias, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's very, very helpful. Um, so I got a string of questions about uh, LinkedIn that I wanted uh, to, to pose to you. Um, so can you talk a little bit about LinkedIn and its importance in the job search process? Um, what are maybe some ways that you can stay top of mind with contacts on LinkedIn or how you can utilize it and stay, stay active? Um, and if you do have any advice on what type of messages would you recommend sending to a new contact or even sending to a recruiter that you connected with on LinkedIn? Yep, absolutely. So I personally, I love LinkedIn. I've found a lot of roles through LinkedIn and through contacts that I've had um, on LinkedIn. Um, that's not to say that there aren't other really great sources um, to look um, or for roles, um, but I think LinkedIn is one of those really great sources. Um, when it comes to making connections on LinkedIn and then also how do I continue to build those connections, um, I would say there are a couple of really good things that you can do. Um, luckily, you've got a really strong network um, with Bauer and with the University of Houston as a whole. So I would say as a student, get plugged into that network and as an alumni, definitely stay plugged into that network. So think about any type of LinkedIn groups. Um, maybe it's an alumni association. Um, you know, HBSA comes to mind as one that has a really strong alumni association that you can get plugged into. Um, maybe you are checking out various different posts on LinkedIn. So sometimes I'll just kind of scroll LinkedIn and, and I'll, I'll throw in some of those keywords, right? So maybe, you know, you're looking for an internship in the tech industry. Maybe you're, you're searching with some of those Boolean strings to find internship, tech industry. Um, I would also recommend um, following companies that you're interested in working for in the future. It kind of helps you get a feel for the company culture, what type of information they post on LinkedIn, but it's also a really great way to stay up to date on when any roles go live or applications for the roles go live that you might be interested in. And then I think the third part of that question, um, just how do you how do you make connections? How do you stay connected with those people? Um, definitely, if you are connecting with someone on LinkedIn, I'll start with a recruiter. If you're connecting with a recruiter, it's probably a really good idea to use that LinkedIn option that allows you to personalize a message before you send the connection. Um, a couple of different reasons for that. Number one, I think recruiters are meeting with new people constantly. So it's a great idea to remind that recruiter how you met them, why you're interested in connecting with them. And it doesn't have to be, you know, long paragraphs, just a short couple of maybe short sentences saying, you know, hey, Mariah, um, got the opportunity to meet with you through the Rockwell AMA, would love to stay connected. Um, would you mind adding me to your network? Boom. And so then you sent that connection request. I know how you know me and we will stay connected. So then on the back end, right, like it's how do you stay connected? One of the things that I do, um, I, I look at my LinkedIn notifications. So when people within my network, um, maybe it's their birthday for people who I'm closer with and I've established a connection, I'll shoot them a quick happy birthday. Um, maybe they got promoted. Maybe they started at a new company. It's shooting a quick congratulations. And maybe that's a great opportunity to open the door um, to say, I'd love to have a quick coffee chat with you. I'd love to set up an informational interview. Maybe someone within your network posted something really cool. Um, maybe it's something about the company that they work for, or maybe it's industry specific knowledge. Um, commenting on their post or maybe sending them a quick um, message saying, hey, you saw your post, thought it was cool. This is why I would love to connect. Those are really great conversation starters and a way for you to continue to not only build your network, but sustain some of those relationships that you've already made. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think that's really great advice. Um, so you talked about the network uh, that our students definitely have here at Bauer. So I'm gonna uh, ask some questions that are more Bauer specific. Um, we had a student ask, can you talk about some qualities that you've seen specifically from Bauer students as a recruiter? Um, how could you highlight, how could students highlight some of those characteristics? 
Yeah, I, I think that's great because I, I love the diversity um, that we get from Bauer students. And I also love, um, I meet a lot of students who I refer to as scrappers um, who are Bauer students. These are the students who are, are really, um, you know, taking initiative. Um, they may be, you know, working through school. And I think, you know, that work experience that you have, whether or not you feel that it's relevant, it's probably relevant in some way, right? Maybe it's not exactly tied to the degree that you are pursuing or the professional route that you'd like to pursue post-graduation. But, you know, I think about even like working in fast food, right? There are some transferable skills there, whether it's leadership qualities, whether it's process improvement, um, that you can definitely speak to in an interview process that will probably set you apart from other candidates because it's showing that, you know, you've got those transferable skills, you know how to take initiative, um, you are hungry to learn and you're continuing to push yourself to do that. Um, and so I think those are some of the really cool things that I see from Bauer students. I also think, you know, you, you can speak to that teamwork aspect in so many ways, um, you know, whether it's through corporate projects that you're working on, um, through classes that you're taking at Bauer, or maybe it's through, um, you know, case competitions that you're getting involved in on campus. Um, it's allowing you to build those collaboration skills. You're thinking outside of the box. Um, you're learning how to work under pressure. Lots of times there are deadlines that are associated with those projects and case competitions. So I think speaking about all of that in the interview process is important and it helps set you apart as a Bauer student. Cool, thank you. No, I, I think that's that's super helpful. Um, uh, I, I think there's a lot of great things that students could talk about their time at Bauer and the importance of getting involved here as well. Um, just being able to talk about those things uh, is, is really helpful in interviews. Um, um, can you talk a little bit about um, the, so, uh, I'm talking about your background a little bit for a second. So you've recruited in a few different industries. Um, can you talk a little bit about the similarities or differences um, in recruiting in different industries and sort of maybe highlight the different industries that you've recruited in or recruited for? Yeah, so um, I started my career as an HR generalist in the tech industry, um, and then I had the opportunity to really get my feet wet and start building my experience in talent acquisition um, at a large sports and outdoors retailer here in the south, southeastern United States. Um, so that was so much fun. And then currently working at a Protivity, at Protivity um, where um, I'm primarily recruiting candidates who are interested in accounting, internal audit. Um, again, tech comes into play. Um, and so I've, I've been able to recruit candidates um, across those different companies for a variety of different um, types of roles, whether it's marketing, um, tech roles, HR. Um, I've had the opportunity to recruit candidates into fashion merchandising. Um, so I think there, there are definitely a lot of similarities, especially when it comes to those internship and entry level roles. I think those five different attributes that I said I look for um, when it comes to um, what makes a strong candidate, that doesn't change a whole lot um, from industry to industry. But I, I do think um, what starts to come into play is some of those technical skills and maybe that industry specific knowledge or your passion for a specific industry. Um, I'll give an example. I've, I've had to learn about coding languages enough to be able to screen a candidate and understand their base level knowledge of coding languages. Um, I'll also say some, some companies require additional interviews to help them determine a candidate's technical knowledge. So when I think about um, you know, productivity and maybe companies in the tech industry, um, case interviews may come into play and that that's the type of interview that's used to help gain a better understanding of a candidate, candidate's critical thinking skills. Um, so I really have to partner with my colleagues because they're the subject matter experts in their field and they can help me understand what are those predictors of success to look for in recent college grads um, within a specific area or with a specific degree plan as it relates to the technical knowledge piece. 
Well, I think that's that's super helpful. Um, since you just mentioned case interviews, um, do you mind talking about case interviews a little bit? Um, what is some advice you have maybe for students preparing for case interviews um, and um, anything just kind of around that that you think might be helpful? Yeah, so so case interviews are one of the interviews that, um, as I mentioned, we, we do use at Protivity and it's really to help assess a candidate's critical thinking skills. Um, for us, our case interview kind of simulates what it's like to work with a client in, in that client environment. Um, and typically, um, case interviews across the board do require a little bit of prep um, prior to the interview. So that's where that research piece is also going to come back into play. Um, I think the important part about case interviews is remembering, you know, doing your homework before the interview, um, but also remembering that your points of contact within an organization are there to help support you as you have any questions. So if you're reviewing materials, you've got questions about how this may play into the interview or maybe just questions about the materials that have been provided for the interview, um, don't hesitate to reach out to your point of contact um, because they can help assist you or clarify anything that you may have questions about. Um, the other part of the case interview, I think, is really just kind of thinking about that type of interview as maybe more so of a puzzle. And if you're getting some sort of materials prior to the interview, that's a piece of the puzzle. Um, but coming into it with the mindset of what are those other pieces of the puzzle? What are those other pieces of information that I might need to be successful? Um, and if I was someone who was working at this company, and this was a real challenge or question um, that I had to face, how would I approach it? And I think when you're putting yourself in those shoes, um, combining the information that you have about the case with the information that you have about the company, maybe doing some additional research about the industry, um, that really will help set you up for success. And questions are absolutely okay to ask. Well, thank you. I mean, I think that's really great information. Um, it is definitely a type of interview that um, you don't, students might not get all the time at a bunch of different companies. So have that information is helpful. And just as a plug, we do have resources at Rockwell that help with those separate interviews. If um, that is something that you're going to have in the interview process, you can reach out to your career council and we can help you out. Um, uh, just want to say we do have about 20 minutes left. So if people have any other questions, um, please feel free to send them to me in chat. And I'll make sure they get asked. Um, we've had some really good questions come in. Um, one of the students sent me a question um, about making their resume uh, kind of friendly for ATS um, uh, by including keywords from the job description and those sort of things. Um, how much percentage of keyword match and resumes are usually used? How important is keyword matching? Can you talk a little bit about kind of what that looks like? Yeah, so um, I will share in full transparency that I have yet to work for a company where um, we solely relied on ATS um, to kind of pull in or do that first screen in of candidates. Um, so I, I, in my experience, have still very much had a hands-on approach with screening candidate resumes. Um, but I will say that um, I think this was mentioned in the question as well, being able to tie in some of those key words from a job description is important when you're thinking about companies that may use an ATS um, to help screen in candidates. Um, so one of the things that I would recommend is definitely taking a look at the job description. Um, you don't wanna use keywords just for the sake of using the keywords, right? You really wanna think about what is the experience that's on my resume? What are those skill sets that I currently possess that are mentioned in the job description that the company is looking for that match up? Um, and so the other thing that I would recommend you doing, <laughs> and I've, I think I've said this earlier, is um, making sure you are tailoring, tailoring your resume for the job that you're applying for. So your resume is not that static copy paste document. Um, you're really thinking about your resume in terms of this job, this role that I'm interested in. And then you can do some tweaks and changes um, depending on the role. For example, 
all of the experience, all of the work experience, the case competitions, the volunteer experience that you have may not be relevant to a specific role. Um, you may want to take a look at your resume and think about what are those relevant experiences that I have, especially if you find that your resume is maybe going over that one page mark. Um, what are the relevant experiences that I have for this specific role? So that's where looking at the job description comes into play. What are those skill sets that this company is looking for? How have I proven that through my job experience? Maybe then it's just kind of pulling out some of the experience that wasn't as relevant, bumping to the top of your resume, but still keeping in um, the sequential order according to time, um, the experience that was most relevant doing some changes to some of those bullets that you've got um, under your, your work experience, remembering that you know those bullets are not just a re-summarization of the prior job description, the role that you had, but actually what are those things that you did to bring value to the role in terms of process improvement, um, in terms of making the role better than it was before you were um, the candidate or, or the um, incumbent in that role. And then um, pulling in keywords on the job description that really do align with your skill sets. Um, for example, if there are certain softwares that um, that role requires and you have familiarity with those softwares, you're maybe you're an expert, adding those to your job or to your resume. Um, if there are you know, skill sets that you have, whether it's handling large amounts of money or um, working in teams or getting specific outcomes, um, make sure you're pulling all of that information into your resume. And I think that will help you when you're looking to be screened in for a specific role. Awesome, thanks. I think it's super helpful. Um, I've got some really good uh, student questions coming in. I'm gonna start with, um, so a student asked, uh, how do you go about applying for a full-time role with a company if maybe you were, didn't, you applied and didn't get a um, uh, internship with that company, but you wanna still apply there full-time? What advice would you give on how to improve on that application and maybe get the interview the next time around? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. So one of the things that I would say, um, a, a couple of tips, but one of the things that I would say that you can probably immediately do and have the most access to doing yourself, um, dependent upon how far you got in the interview process for that, um, the internship position, is really kind of thinking about what did that interview process look like? What do I know about the internship position and any feedback that I got through the interview process um, that I can take as actionable steps to improve myself while I'm applying for the full-time role? Um, so I, I think about things like um, the internship is probably going to be a really good um, representation of what might be expected in that entry level full time role. So anything that you can glean from what they were looking for in that internship candidate and how since you've applied, you may have approved, improved in some of those areas. I would first start with maybe maybe buffing up my resume, um, reviewing any feedback, any notes that I got through the interview process um, for the internship. And then if you have a point of contact um, with the company, maybe it was a recruiter that you met through the interview process, maybe it was um, you know, someone who works at the company that you met through the interview process, or just a, a point of contact that was helping you with scheduling, I'd reach out to that person. I would see if, if and some companies aren't able to or won't share feedback, but I would see if I could get some real tangible feedback from, you know, how either how you performed in the interview process or what are those things that the company is looking for um, from a full-time candidate. Even if it's setting up an informational interview with someone who's currently working in a similar entry-level role and understanding, you know, what what is it that made you successful in the interview process when you went through the interview process and how can you take those things to help yourself um, as you're applying for the full-time role. 
So I do a little bit of research on the back end. I'd also recommend reaching out to anyone that you might be able to get some more tangible feedback from. And then, um, you know, submitting your resume after you've done some scrubbing, some reworking of it um, will probably help you. Um, and then the last thing I would point out, if there are any connection points that you can make with the recruitment team, um, whether it's webinars, interviews, stopping back by um, at the career fair and saying, hey, I applied for the internship last summer. I'm still really, really interested in the company and I'm going to apply um, for a full-time role. Is there any advice that you can give me in the process? Um, those are things that might help you that second time around. Awesome, thank you. I think that was super helpful. Um, so, uh, one of the questions that came in that students said, I'm interested in the consultant department of creativity specifically, um, but I think you could talk about this for that specifically, but also in general, um, what would you like to see students do in the summer to show initiative and maybe stand up from other candidates? Yeah, so I think there are lots of things that you can do, um, even if it's not, you know, if maybe you haven't secured an internship for the summer, um, maybe you're a little earlier on in the process for an internship. Um, I think networking comes to mind. Um, so happy to have you reach out to me. Um, I can share my contact information, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, but I think kind of getting that conversation started is really important and that helps with showing initiative. Um, and then asking, you know, are there any resources that I can check out um, to, to start that research process, right? So as it relates to productivity, um, I would say, check out our company website. We also have a careers blog that has additional information that gives you more of kind of the that tangible sense of what the day-to-day -day life might look like in a specific role. Um, follow our social media channels, whether that's Instagram or maybe checking out our YouTube page. There's some really cool videos there, again, where you can actually hear from leaders and people who are currently working in the role to get more of a sense of what that job might look like. Um, and then making those connection points at career fairs. Um, I think the more you can kind of just get in front of someone, you want, you want that face name recognition, right? You want them to say, oh, I remember talking at this per talking to this person at the career fair or I remember this person attended our webinar and I think that's helping the recruiter get to know man this person really is interested and they're taking that initiative um, but it's also helping you to continue to learn more about the company as a whole and the role which is just going to set you up for success in the interview process and help you determine whether or not um, productivity is a good fit for you. Cool, thank you so much. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, so I just wanted to kind of end our conversation with, um, could you give uh, what your biggest piece of advice uh, that if you wanted to share one thing with uh, students uh, that are recruiting right now, what would be the biggest piece of advice that you'd give them? Yeah, um, Zach, that's so tough, but I think, I think my biggest piece of advice, and if I'm thinking about what I would have wished that I would have heard, or maybe someone told me um, when I was a, a candidate recruiting, I think it's it's really be yourself. Um, so I, I am one of those people that really does believe that um, things happen for a reason, but I think there are things that you can do to help prepare yourself, to set you up for success. And once you've done those things, um, I think the next important step is really just being yourself. Um, the, the interview process, the recruiting process with a company, it's a two-way street, right? Um, some people might find this cringy, but I, I think it's kind of like dating because really you want to make sure that it's a good fit for you and it's a good fit for the company. So you are interviewing that company just as much as they're interviewing you. You wanna make sure you're asking all the questions that you can to make sure that when you get in role and in seat, because I know you're all qualified to get the offer, um, that you are going to love what you do. Um, and maybe you won't love that first role, but I want you to feel like you've asked enough questions to know exactly what you're stepping into. And you consciously made that decision that 
this out of this company out of all the other companies that I spoke with was the best company for me. Um, so I think really being yourself, um, it, it has to be a good fit on both ends is, is kind of my, my last piece of advice. Thank you, Mariah, so much uh, for joining us today. Thanks for having me.